Well, good morning and welcome back to the Kennedy Space Center for this historic mission as we once again uh, prepare to launch Bob and Doug from right out there on pad 39A on that uh, Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. Truly an exciting time, but hey, where was this weather Wednesday afternoon? <laughs> you know, obviously it's a, it's a challenge to compete with the weather here in Florida in the summer, but uh, we're going to do what's right. So we're moving ahead, and uh, it sounds like we got about a 50-50 chance with the weather uh, again tomorrow, and we'll see how it works out. With that, it's my privilege to introduce our administrator, Jim Bridenstine. Jim? Thank you, sir. Well, thank you, Bob. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's right. Uh, our highest priority is and always has been Bob and Doug. And, of course, uh, a couple of days ago, we had, we had too much electricity in the atmosphere. Uh, and the challenge there is not that we were in a lightning storm or anything like that. The challenge is that um, a launch could, in fact, trigger lightning. Uh, in fact, the rocket itself could become a lightning bolt. And, uh, and so we, we had this, uh, these parameters set ahead of time. Both the, the NASA and the SpaceX teams uh, knew exactly what the parameters were. Those parameters were limitations, I should say. Those limitations were exceeded. And, um, and that put us in a position to delay the launch. Uh, I think this is certain, though. We are going to launch American astronauts on American rockets from American soil, um, and we will do it um, with the absolute, um, uh, the absolute priority being the safety of our astronauts. And I will tell you, I'm very proud of the NASA team, I'm very proud of the SpaceX team. Um, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the comments I had in the interviews ahead of time were, um, are you going to feel undue pressure because of you know, the, all of the attention on this, not just attention in the United States, but attention globally, all of the VIPs that were here, um, are you going to feel undue pressure to launch? And, you know, we have all been in agreement that um, there will be no pressure. We will launch when we are ready. Um, and I'll tell you, the president and the vice president were proud of the NASA team and the SpaceX team for making the right call for the right reasons. And, um, and again, when we do this again Saturday, if we do it again on Sunday, um, we will feel no pressure. We will go when we are ready. Safety is the highest priority, and that's what we're focused on. So with that, we'll uh, open it up to questions. Jim, did you want to have a few words here? Could I have you bet, absolutely. Uh, Jim Moorhart, Deputy NASA Administrator, and I'll tell you, he's a, a great friend, and uh, we are honored to have him as our deputy, um, having worked many years um, in the Senate. Uh, he helps us a lot with the, the political aspects of the job that, that I deal with every day. So thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Good morning. You know, I just really want to start by saying, you know, we're at the dawn of a new age, and we're really leading the beginning of a space revolution. And think about it. This is really something much bigger than all of us. But really, our hope and prayer for tomorrow is to inspire the next generation and to give hope for many people who need it right now, and also to unite our country and the world. And you think about, I guess what I'm trying to say is we need your support. And I hope you'll stay with us as we get this flight test, whether it's tomorrow or the next day or whenever we go after that. Deke Slayton once said, he was a Mercury 7 astronaut, and he said, a good scrub is better than a bad launch any day. And that's where we're at. Thank you. Questions? We'll just go to, go to questions. Hi. Um, morning, Jim. Irene Klotz. Yes, Avi Irene. Aviation Week. Um, uh, for you or for Mr. Cabana, um, 
Was there anything at all out of the uh, first, uh, the countdown on, um, I forgot what day already, Wednesday, that is being changed, tweaked, anything the team's learned that's going to be applied for this? And uh, I have a quick question for Nicole. Um, the, uh, of course, this isn't Boeing's uh, day today, but there's another, we're going to do this all again in a, in a little while. Can you just give us an update on where you are with your training for your flight? Thanks. Uh, yeah, so certainly um, this was interesting. We, we have done a dry dress rehearsal. We have never done a, a wet dress rehearsal. And so um, getting from a, a position of, uh, you know, fueling the rocket um, and uh, you know, arming the launch abort system and these kind of things that we went through um, and then defueling and, and those. So, yes, there were, um, there were learning opportunities there. We're always gathering data. Um, but I will tell you, the rocket was ready to go. The crew capsule was ready to go. All the ground systems were working um, according to plan. Um, so no, I would say not a whole lot of, no, no big changes. But uh, uh, it, it is good for the agency to have a wet dress rehearsal behind us. So that's all very positive. And um, you know, every time we do one step further, uh, we learn things. So that's, that's good for the agency. Uh, the second question was what? For Nicole about Nicole. Uh, Starliner. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, we are absolutely tremendously so proud of the NASA and SpaceX team. And you know what? We are calling this the beginning of flight test season. And it really is. What you're going to see is the historic launch of the NASA SpaceX Crew Dragon, hopefully tomorrow or this weekend. Following that, next year, you're going to see the launch of Boeing Starliner. And then right on the heels of that, you're going to see the launch of Orion on SLS. And so we've talked about the beginning, this first step in this roadmap of us going to the moon in the Artemis mission. There's going to be a lot of launches coming up from Florida, and there's going to be a lot of movement. And it's starting with the SpaceX launch. Morning, Eric Von Aiken, WKMG TV, CBS Orlando. So nice to be here. Godspeed tomorrow. Thank you for taking our questions. Uh, I want to ask you about the the 45th Task Force specifically. Uh, as as you know, America's best just down the coast from us uh, at Patrick Air Force Base. We met them. Are going to rescue Bob and Doug. God forbid something goes wrong. They end up in the water somewhere. They showed us the equipment they've been training, as you know, for years. In fact, what they told us is they really started their training after the shuttle program ended in 2011. They're so excited. They have this warehouse full of stuff, 150 men and women. And they only step in, as you know, if something goes wrong. If not, we're not going to see about them. We're not going to hear about them. They didn't say this, but I sensed a little bit of sadness that that they're not going to get the glory when Bob and Doug finally do come home and we can welcome our heroes back, right? Is there any way to give them some of the glory? They know this is SpaceX's show. We understand that. Is there any way to involve them a little bit considering what they're going to do and probably never be seen? So I'll be happy to take that. And of course, uh, I'll tell you, Bob Cabana works with the 45th Space Wing day in and day out. They are amazing partners for NASA. Um, but yes, the, you know, DET-3, which is part of the 45th Space Wing, um, is the organization that um, should something go wrong and the launch abort system is, is triggered, uh, they will be rescuing Bob and Doug. Um, and they're also going to be involved in, in recovery. Um, but even beyond that, the 45th Space Wing does so, so, so much more than just recovery. The 45th Space Wing is involved in helping us uh, understand second by second what the weather is, helping us with the data, helping us with um, the, the numerical weather models for the weather. Um, they help us, of course, uh, with the range, uh, making sure that we have everything we need for the range and clearance of the range. This is their range. Um, and and they are, uh, they are amazing partners. This whole launch, we, you know, we, we have branded this, uh, you know, importantly. This is not launch NASA. It's not launch SpaceX. It's launch America. This is America's launch. And the interagency is critical to this effort. And, of course, the, the, the 45th Space Wing, um, which is, you know, a new component of the brand new Space Force. I, I want to reemphasize um, that, that's, that they are now part of the Space Force. Um, and emphasize that we have other partners as well. Uh, the FAA is very involved in this launch. 
the Department of Transportation, of course, is, is the parent of the FAA. So this is an all-of-America effort, um, and, uh, and when we launch, it will be, it will be Launch America. Bob? You know, I just want to emphasize what the administrator said. Space flight is a team sport. None of us are successful unless all of us are successful. And uh, I, we couldn't have a better relationship than we do with uh, General Doug Shess and the uh, 45th Space Wing. Uh, we wouldn't be here without them. Uh, everything that we have done working with the Space Wing, working with uh, the FAA to improve our operations, to enable commercial operations in a more uh, user-friendly environment, you know, this has been years in the making getting us to where we are right now. And, uh, you know, it, it's not just the engineering team, it's not just NASA, it's not just the commercial crew program. I mean, this is across the board. It's all of the support organizations within NASA and the Air Force that are helping make this a successful launch. As the administrator said, this is Launch America. This isn't just launch, you know, commercial crew. So uh, our whole nation needs to take pride in this, and everybody has had a role to play. You know, they need to own this. It's, it, they, they are part of it. We wouldn't be here if everybody wasn't playing their role in making us successful. Administrator, great to see you again. This is Gio Benitez over at ABC News. Uh, obviously, this is Florida. The weather can do whatever it wants to do. Uh, but the forecasts aren't looking so great for tomorrow and for Sunday. So some of our viewers have been wondering, why not wait till the weather is good? Why go through the whole process when you have lightning in the area and such? Yeah, so we're balancing so many different things right now. And that's an important question. And I just want people to know that when we balance all of these things, there is always always, always going to be uncertainty. Uh, we could wait another week and we can see that the weather's going to be good. The question is, why is the weather good a week from now? And the answer is, well, because the winds are going to be east to west. And so all of the, all of the, the, the cumulonimbus clouds, all of the, the storm systems are going to be on the west coast of Florida. So the weather looks like it's going to be fantastic. The problem is, when the, we when the winds are east to west, if we have a pad abort capability, which we now have, which we didn't have under the space shuttle, if we have a pad abort uh, triggered, um, you know, we're going to have our astronauts landing on land. And that is, that, is not, that is not an option for us. So we're balancing a lot of things. We're also balancing the time of day that we launch, making sure that um, we, we have to consider the sleep cycles of the crew to make sure that they're not you know, in the midst of a, a, a very critical um, portion of the flight when they've been, you know, without sleep for a period of, you know, 24 hours. And, and that won't happen, by the way, because we're managing for that. But it's not just the sleep cycles of the crew, it's also the sleep cycles on the International Space Station, and all of these things that we're balancing have to match. So we, we have these very unique opportunities of time. <laughs> it's interesting, when you talk about launching to the International Space Station, your launch window is not a window at all. It's instantaneous. And if you don't meet it, you don't go. So you have to have all of these things um, met a, you know, ahead of time, and then you, you select the window. And if the weather is good, you go. If the weather is not good, you don't go. And then, so we do have these different opportunities in the coming week and weeks ahead. But it's important to note, and Bob just said this in a meeting we had earlier, we cannot forget this is a test flight. This is a test flight. We're not in normal operations. We are learning. Everything we're doing right now as an institution is about learning. Um, and and as, we, as we get ready for this launch, um, we want to make sure that we have everything as safe as possible. Again, can't say it enough, Bob and Doug are our highest priority. This is a test flight. And, and we will go when, when everything um, is, is as safe as we can possibly make it. Excellent. Thank you, you so much. Uh, good morning. This is Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press. Um, I'd like the two active astronauts, perhaps, to answer this. Um, this is being described as a revolution, a new dawn, and I'd like you to tell me what your image of the future is going to look like in your lifetimes. I mean, is it too much to hope for Jetsons, Tony Stark, uh, Iron Man? I mean, realistically, um, what do you want to leave people with in what's possible in our lifetimes? Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. You know, I'm still waiting for my personal jetpack, but uh, 
the, the future is incredibly exciting. Um, it's been said many times already that, uh, that we are really at the cusp of um, the next generation of space flight. And that is so true. What we're going to witness uh, in the near future, hopefully tomorrow, um, is the culmination of that uh, relationship between a government and a commercial entity that's helping us to get to low Earth orbit and um, to get to the International Space Station. My vision for the future is that this ignites um, that, that next generation of space flight. Um, I look forward to seeing Artemis take uh, the first woman and the next man to the, to the lunar surface uh, for a permanent habitat where we'll be doing research um, and science and exploration on the moon and that that will serve then as a launching pad uh, to get us to Mars. And I think that that is doable within um, my lifetime and I'm so excited about this launch because I remember when I was in second grade watching the space shuttle launch. Teacher wheeled a television into our classroom and that inspired me to recognize that this job of exploration was a possibility for me. And tomorrow's launch is going to do that for our next generation of scientists, um, explorers, and astronauts. And it's that generation that's going to that take us to the moon and to, the, and to Mars and beyond. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, I think what I look forward to is a vision where the younger generation sees no limitations in their life whether that be because of their, their gender or their orientation or their nationality or anything, they just see possibilities. And so what this allows, this partnership between the public and private and the commercialization of low Earth orbit, is you'll see these opportunities open up in the future. And I vision that opportunity where it's not just astronauts, not just government folks that are going to low Earth orbit, but there are other folks. There are scientists and doctors, there are poets, they're reporters. I mean, imagine if you were up there and you were able to capture with your own eyes and write this incredible story. You could convey that to all of America, to all of the world, much better than we could, could tell our story to you. So I see this as a real possibility. I think that this word unbelievable perhaps shall be stricken from the dictionary because you see a launch and you go, oh my gosh, that's unbelievable. But it's, it's not. It's believable. We're watching it. It's happening. This change is making place. This step is happening. You're going to see low Earth orbit open up. You're going to see us go to the moon. You're going to see Artemis. You're going to see a man and a woman on the moon. And eventually, you'll see us on Mars. Hey, uh, Joey Roulette with Reuters. A um, question for Jim Bridenstine. Um, have you talked to Bob and Doug since, they, uh, since the mission was scrubbed? How are they doing? Are they eager to go to the station, and um, have you come any closer to a decision on how long Bob and Doug will be staying on the ISS since we seem to have locked down the uh, August 30th date for their next crewed mission, or for SpaceX's next crewed mission? Thanks. Yeah, so we have to remember that, uh, number one, this is a test flight, and what we learn on this flight will determine what we do for crew one. So, um, yes, we're targeting a date of August 30th. Uh, I, I know you used the word locked down, and nothing is locked down before you do a test flight. So. Um, we're going to do this test flight. Uh, Bob and Doug are in great spirits. They are ready to go. Um, and certainly, um, uh, I, we've been in touch via, via text. Um, and of course, I'll be, I'll be talking to them uh, before they launch again, so before they get ready to launch again. So thank you. Thanks. Hi, Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. Uh, question maybe for one of the astronauts, Jill or Nicole. Uh, have you had a chance to talk to Bob and Doug as well? I just wanted to see if you have any more insights about their experience on Wednesday, getting on top of a rocket, having you know propellant loaded into it for the first time. There was a lot of discussion about the risk involved with that, uh, with the load and go fueling procedure. Just want to get their perspective and your perspective on that. And for Administrator Brinstein, uh, just to update on uh, Boeing's schedule right now, if you have an update on when their second OFT flight test will occur and when their crew flight test might occur. Thank you. So I was uh, fortunate enough to talk to Doug Hurley the night before their first launch attempt. And, uh, and you know, he, I think he gave me a call because I'll be the next Marine flying. And, and he wanted to give me a little bit maybe of fatherhood. And so we talked about the weather and I asked him, you know, how does that feel? Well, how would it feel like to scrub? You know, do you have concerns? And, uh, and he didn't, he mentioned that when he, the first time he flew on shuttle, he scrubbed like five or six times before they actually launched. And so he said, you just have to keep in mind that you need to remain flexible. 
right? And that calls are going to be made and decisions are made, and you know everybody is out there uh, keeping you safe and making sure that we're going to have a successful mission. And so I thought that was a really good, you know, key for really applicable to the rest of life. Like there's plenty of things in life that you can't control, weather being one of them. And you just need to remain flexible, not waste any energy on those things you can't control. And then do what you need to do, prepare. And then when it's time for the next launch opportunity, you know you're ready to go. As uh, far as uh, a replay of OFT1, we're targeting by the end of the year. I think that's uh, eminently achievable. Um, I would say for their first launch of crew, um, that's yet to be determined. Hi, this is uh, Daniel Oberhaus with Wired Magazine. Uh, this is a question for the administrator. Um, I know we're all not hoping for another scrub this weekend, but given that things aren't uh, looking so great right now. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about the precautions that NASA takes. You know, I would imagine you have to shut down the range, bump stuff back. So can you tell us about that and also the costs per scrub for NASA? Yeah, that's a that's an important question. Um, a couple of things uh, that, we're, that we have to consider uh, when, when we make these kind of decisions. Number one, we don't consider cost um, because, again, there is no cost to the lives of Bob and Doug. Uh, we will do whatever it takes to make sure that they are safe. Um, but w w for example, right now we're going through a process thinking, okay, tomorrow it's about a 50% probability that we're going to have the conditions capable of launching um, at the time of launch here at the Cape. Um, and of course, when you add in the, the uncertainty downrange, because we have a launch abort capability, um, we, we have to have the right weather conditions downrange at the same time. Um, and so... The question is, if we have a 50% probability uh, and then the next opportunity is on Sunday, we could put ourselves in a position where we're doing back-to-back -back wet dress rehearsals <laughs> Saturday and Sunday. And, and, and the thing that we have, to, we have to start considering the human factors of that. The human factors end up um, adding some risk as well because it wears everybody out, including our astronauts, although they never complain. <laughs> Uh, we, want, we want to make sure that everybody is well rested and ready to go. So one of the things that we might do um, even today, this afternoon, we're going to get another weather brief and we might make a decision that Sunday is the day, not Saturday. That way, and again, it's going to depend on the, what, what, what are, everything is a range of probabilities. What are the probabilities on Saturday and the probabilities on Sunday? Um, and if, the, if it's a high enough probability on Saturday, we, we, we target that day. So we're, we're looking at all of these different options that, that we have to consider. Earlier I mentioned, you know, that we have to consider sleep cycles. So we want to launch at a time where our crew, you know, if, 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 if the time to orbit is 15 to, to 20 hours, that's kind of in the sweet spot because then they can get on orbit, they can get some rest, um, and then they can dock to the International Space Station. And so getting that right is, is important as well. When we talk about their sleep cycles, uh, depending on the day we launch and the time we launch, you know, we've got, we've got phase burns and we've got boost burns that we have to get accomplished. And of course, if those are in the middle of the times when the astronauts are trying to catch some sleep, then that's not optimum either. So, um, so yes, uh, we're, we're having to balance all of these things. There is cost associated with the delay. Make no mistake, there is cost. We, we load the rocket with liquid oxygen. We unload the rocket with liquid oxygen. We've got all of these people here at the Cape that are um, focused on getting the mission accomplished. There is absolutely cost associated. As far as like the, um, the total dollar amount, uh, given all of the things that we do, I, I don't have that number just handily, handy right now. Um, but there is cost associated. But again, compared to the investment that took us to get to this point, those costs are really, really minimal. And um, compared to the, the lives of Bob and Doug, we, we, we are not worried about that. Um, remember, this is a test flight. <laughs> we need to make sure that um, we are maximizing the opportunity for success, and that's what we're focused on. Just briefly, do you have a ballpark figure? Are we talking like hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars? We'll get you a number. Okay, thank yep. you. Yep. Hi, this is Michael Sheets. I'm with CNBC. My question is for Jim, and uh, Bob can probably help uh, add a little color here. Uh, Jim, you've asked people to stay home for this mission, given you know we're all wearing masks, we're all social distancing here on site. Uh, but the visitor complex reopened the day after the scrub. Um, so this launch attempt is going to see people be able to come to the visitor center. 
and as well as it's it's the weekend people don't have to take off work if they want to come try to watch uh, the first time we've launched crew in almost a decade so what kind of uh, measures is nasa taking that's different than we saw on launch day on wednesday and what kind of crowds are is nasa expecting in the local area and even to welcome on site so just so you're aware um yes uh i don't know what the count is but lots and lots of people came uh, to the Cape <laughs> to watch this launch. Um, so I'll tell you what we're considering as an agency. Um, this is an important mission for us. We also have in July, we're launching a robot to Mars. And so we have to protect uh, the safety and the health of the workforce here at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, and then of course, once Demo 2 is successful, which it will be, once Demo 2 is successful, we're going to launch Crew 1. So right here at the Kennedy Space Center, we have no shortage of opportunities in front of us. And we have to make sure that without question, um, you know, we're doing everything we can to keep our people safe right here at the Kennedy Space Center, keep them healthy. Remember, if we have an outbreak, um, all of the contract tracing begins, and then all of these mission essential people end up, could be, end up getting sidelined. That is not the outcome that, that we're looking for. So um, the visitor center is open. You know, there is no doubt times are changing and people are going to travel and the visitor center is going to be open. What we expect is that when people come here, they follow the guidance of the governor of the state of Florida, that they follow the guidance for social distancing um, and, and, you know, personal protective equipment if you're not going to maintain that distance. Um, and, and if people do that, um, they're going to be safe, but we will make sure that the people that are involved in these mission essential functions for this country, launching American astronauts on American rockets from American soil, launching our next rover to Mars, that these mission essential functions um, will not be placed in jeopardy. And I'd like to add to that. First off, uh, the visitor center, it's a limited opening. It's not full capacity. They limited the number of people that uh, could come on to the main complex. There are no bus tours. They're not going out to the Saturn V. So it's in keeping with what uh, Disney has done and uh, Universal has done at City Walk. Uh, not even all of the venues on the main complex are going to be open. And this was planned to open. Uh, you know, had we launched on time, it would have been after the launch. It just turned out with the scrub that now those folks that come to the visitor center are going to be able to view it from uh, from the visitor center, but they have strict rules in place uh, for CDC guidance. Um, you know, all I can say is they're doing it in the safest way possible and in keeping with uh, Governor DeSantis's guidelines for helping to open up uh, the state of Florida. But it is by no means a full opening of the space uh, visitor center. Can Kennedy Visitor Center, and it, it is a, a limited participation. Here on site, as uh, the administrator mentioned, you know, we're still in stage three for our guidelines on site for the coronavirus. Uh, you know, we require folks to wear masks in common areas, you know, in buildings, uh, if they cannot be six feet apart, uh, they have to wear a mask uh, in hallways, common areas, elevators, and so on. Uh, so we are taking this seriously. We have to protect our workforce to ensure that we can complete NASA's mission essential work. Hi, uh, Ken Chang, New York Times. I just had a question. I was wondering what Bob and Doug are doing do, during these two days of downtime that they, of course, did not want. So they'll, they will um, probably, I don't know, honestly, they might spend a little time at the beach house. Um, I, again, I don't know, but I would guess that's probably what they, they'll do. They've uh, they started a new tradition of, of launching little rockets. I, I, don't, I don't know if you've seen any of that, but uh, they started a new tradition of launching uh, rockets from the beach at the beach house before a big launch. Um, and so I would imagine they're probably getting some downtime. They're probably... Um, you know, thinking about what's what's coming, uh, maybe some changes that they'd like to have for their next um, their next route to the uh, to the rocket. Um, Chell and Nicole, do you guys have any insight here? So I launched on a Soyuz rocket out of Baikonur, and even with our launch, uh, we experienced a delay. And um, so you know, you certainly get excited about the launch. You're prepared. Your mindset is such that uh, that you're ready to fly. Um, and certainly Bob and Doug uh, were ready to do that. 
um, on Wednesday. And, and so um, the scrub, the delay, just represents an opportunity uh, for the team to, to learn and then uh, an, an opportunity for them to uh, reunite with their families. I know they're spending time uh, with their families and, and enjoying this uh, little bit of time before they get ready to fly again. I'm sure they're getting briefings um, from the SpaceX team, from the NASA team, on what the weather looks like, how the vehicle looks, and then, uh, and then getting back into the zone for uh, whatever we desi decide for tomorrow or Sunday. Good morning. Hi, uh, Greg Pallone, Spectrum News 13. Uh, this is for the administrator and also Mr. Uh, Cabana. You know, it's been nine years, nine years since the Space Coast, since America saw a launch. Uh, this area was devastated after the shuttle retired. Lots of people laid off. What type of inspiration after nine years does this flight mean for the Space Coast in particular and Florida? Thank you. Oh, it's, it's absolutely huge. And I, I cannot compliment Bob Cabana and his team here at the Kennedy Space Center enough. Um, as you mentioned, when the space shuttles were retired nine years ago, um, th this area was devastated. And then that was with the cancellation of the moon program, Constellation. So all of those jobs that were anticipated were also eliminated. And it was, it was all at once, and it was absolutely devastating. Um, and so what has happened now is Bob and his team have put together, and I'm saying this because Bob won't brag about himself, but they've put together this multi-use spaceport. So we've got commercial, we've got civil, uh, and of course, you know, we've got military launches that are happening from this facility now in a very robust way. And, and the economy has come back. Um, the markets are, are working here in a way that um, we couldn't have even envisioned nine years ago. And now we have, um, you know, a budget, a NASA budget um, that is the highest it's ever been in history in nominal dollars. Um, and it's as high as it's been, you know, obviously Apollo in real dollars was higher, but we're, our trajectory is right. Um, you know, when I took over this, this job, our budget was $19 billion, and the budget request for next year is $25 billion. For the first time since 1972, we have a human landing system funded to go to the surface of the moon, and not just funded, but also under contract for the development of that human landing system. Um, and of course, with the, the development of the Space Force and the 45th Space Wing, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, there's going to be lots and lots of economic opportunity happening here. Some of it for good reason, because we want to do exploration, science, discovery. Some of it for not so good reason, because we've got bad actors around the world that are making space more dangerous. And we need the 45th Space Wing. We need the Air Force to do what is necessary to keep our country and our exploration and the commercial capabilities of space um, safe. Um, but I will tell you, right now, um, we're thrilled to have the support from the administration at the level that we have it. We've got strong bipartisan support. One of my jobs as the NASA administrator, and I took this very seriously when I took the job, how do we create a program that is sustainable? How do we create a program that's not going to invest billions of dollars and then get canceled? Well. We do it by getting strong bipartisan support, which we are having. Um, we do it by making sure our international partners are engaged and contributing significantly in dollar values and in capabilities, which they are doing. We think about the gateway, building a space station in orbit around the moon. Um, our international partners want to go to the moon with us, and we, of course, welcome that. The President's Space Policy Directive 1 said go to the moon, go sustainably, go with international partners, go with commercial partners. We now have when, when we go to the moon in 2024, we're going to go with a commercial human landing system. So we're expecting um, our providers to go get customers that are not NASA, driving down our costs, increasing access. So we're building the markets that make it sustainable. The, his, the history of spaceflight is that the government created the demand and the government created the supply. And when you do that, you are always limited and you are subject to the whimsical budgets of politicians. And that's where we were nine years ago. And because of the great work of Bob and his team, because of the vision to commercialize space, uh, that's not where we are today. Um, we need a resilient space program that includes the best that America has to offer from a government perspective, from a commercial perspective. We need to bring a coalition of nations with us, which is what the international partnerships are all about. We need bipartisan support. And more than anything, the reason I'm here <laughs> 
we need these people that are watching on television right now to support the program, and they do. Um, and that's why we do so much communication outreach. If we have public support, then of course we get the support of the representatives in Congress, which uh, of course provide NASA's budgets. And they have been overwhelmingly supportive in a bipartisan way. So um, yes, we all remember what happened nine years ago. We remember it. Um, and we're doing everything in our power to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And that's my job as the NASA administrator. Bob, I'll let you say a few words. First off, thank you, Jim, for your kind words. I, I'm just extremely pleased to be a, a member of this team. It is awesome what we've accomplished. And Greg, you said we haven't seen a launch in nine years. I'd like to say any time a rocket ship leaves planet Earth, I don't care what's on it, it is an event and worthy of note. But uh, you know, you talk about humans and what it means. I happen to see a picture of the Max Brewer Bridge for the last launch attempt in uh, Titusville there. And uh, it looked like uh, the last flight of the space shuttle. Uh, our nation, it means a lot to see our astronauts launching on U.S. rockets from U.S. soil. And any time you put a human on a rocket, it all, it, it's another step up. I mean, it, it raises the level of concern, it raises the level of importance, it raises the level of our looking into it to make sure that everything is right. And uh, yeah, it, it's awesome. I can't tell you what it's going to mean to me to see a U.S. rocket launching crews again off that pad out there. That's what they were designed for. We went to the moon from that pad. I launched three times off that pad. You know, to see Bob and Doug launch off it and then to get uh, Boeing launching, we are on the verge of a new era in human spaceflight. This is just the beginning. It's only going to get better. So, yeah, it means a lot, and I truly am excited about it. To me, it's a culmination of a lot of hard work by this team here at the Kennedy Space Center, and I couldn't be more pleased. Thanks. I, I enjoy every launch, too, by the way. Just You know that. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. This will be our last question. Uh, hi, Marcia Dunn, AP again for Mr. Brian Stein. How much um, credit do you put on Elon Musk personally to be where you are today? Um, I know it's a big effort, but, you know, he's, uh, he's the linchpin in it all. And he's also a colorful, high-profile figure for lots of different reasons. How much of um, attention is being drawn to all this just by virtue of him as a, as a person? You know, it's a, it's a, it's, you're making a wonderful point. Um, what Elon Musk has done for the American space program is he has brought vision and inspiration that we hadn't had uh, you know, for you know, 10 years since the retirement of the space shuttles, nine years. Um, and and I, I will tell you, he's, he's, he's brilliant, um, he's capable, he has you know, I've been the NASA administrator now for over two years, um, and there have been times when maybe there was a little tension because of the priorities that we were focused on. Um, but when I talk to him, when I meet with him, he gives me a commitment and he delivers on that commitment. That has happened every single time. Um, so we're very proud of the team that he has at SpaceX. We're very proud of the partnership between NASA and SpaceX. Um, and yes, in this particular case, we're at a point in time where um, we've asked him to do certain things and he has absolutely delivered. Yeah, Jim Moorhart. I'd just like to add to that. You know, I was uh, witnessed the flight readiness review last week and it was said, you know, we started out as a partnership and in many respects, we be it's become a friendship. Now there's still a healthy you know, uh, distance between a contractor and this agency. But there are a lot of relationships, and that's what makes our success. They actually embedded Bob and Doug into their manufacturing facilities so that their line workers got to know them personally. So they're personally invested in their safety. And it really, it goes, yes, as Jim said, from Elon, but it goes down to the line worker. And we're very, I can't reiterate how much Jim has said. And, you know, it's Jim's vision, the vice president and the president's vision. But they're helping us execute that vision. Well said. That was the last question. Okay. Do you have any closing remarks? Well, this is, uh, I want to reemphasize, this is a test flight. Um, we learned a lot a couple of days ago. And in the days ahead, we're going to learn even more. Part of what we're learning are what we need to be safe to launch as it relates to the weather. 
Um, and of course, uh, we, we're looking at Saturday, we're looking at Sunday. Um, we have some other days beyond that where we could launch. Um, the 7th and the 8th are, are reserved, but you know, we're looking at maybe the 2nd and the 3rd as well, although that's not a certainty at this point. But I just want to reemphasize that this is a test flight, um, that we're going to do everything we can to keep Bob and Doug 100% safe. They are ready to go. They were ready to go before. They're even more ready to go now. Um, and, uh, and this agency we call NASA is about to pull off something spectacular with our partners at SpaceX, and we're very excited about it. So thank you all for coming and covering this press conference. Thank you. That concludes the press conference. Have a great day.